Joining us now is Ojineka. Jinex. Who stories trending around the world? What Hello, Jinex. <laughs> I saw you passing exam papers. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, Good morning, Good morning to drop How are you? Good morning. That's great. Thank you. Great, great, great. great. Good morning. Should we pass notes around? Yes, we need I to know. tell everybody I mean, we pass notes. I love it. Don't have your note back. So she's out at us. Yes, I've written your note. I love it. Good morning, Rafai. Good morning, Rafai. All right, good. Great as always. Yeah. Well, good morning to you, viewers. Here are some of the stories that are trending across the globe. In the United States. Billionaire Jeff Bezos' space travel company, Blue Origin, announced on Monday that Star Trek actor William Shatner will blast off into space from West Texas on October 12th. The 90-year-old actor will become the oldest person to go to space, and he'll join three others aboard the Blue Origin capsule. While in Russia, in a historic first, actor Yulia Peresold and film director Klim Chipenko are set to blast off into space today to make a feature film titled Challenge, a project the nation's space chief has held as a chance to raise the prestige of the country's space program. In Sweden, two American scientists, Davis Julius and Ordem Patapotium on Monday, won the Nobel Prize in Medicine for their discoveries into how the human body perceives temperature and touch. And the death of artist Lars Willicks who lived under police protection since making a sketch of Prophet Muhammad with an animal's body in 2007 has made the rounds. Velix, who died at a weekend car crash, along with two police bodyguards, was 75 years old. In Ethiopia, Nigeria's President Muhammad Buhari called on citizens to put personal interests aside and work towards lasting peace in Addis Ababa on Monday at the inauguration of the country's Prime Minister, Abiy Ahmed, for a second term in office. Reactions trail. Under sports, Nigerian forward Victor Osimen and Senegalese defender Kalidu Kolobai on Monday revealed on social media the racist abuse they received from Fiorentina fans during Sunday's 2-1 away win. They are both calling for racist fans to be kept out of stadiums forever. Finally, under entertainment, Nigerian music superstars Wizkid and Temilade Okweni, popularly known as Thames on Monday, received a platinum plaque, each for essence, their collaborative project. The pair received their plaques at the Novo event space in Los Angeles, California, after the song attained over 400,000 sales in the United States. Well, let's begin what's trending with the global outage suffered by Facebook and its Instagram and WhatsApp platforms, which plunged the services and businesses of over 3 billion people who rely on them into chaos for hours on Monday. Facebook apologized late Monday, stating that the root cause of the outage was a faulty configuration change and stressed that there is no evidence that user data was compromised as a result of the outage, as it's been reported in the news. The outage follows a major crisis the company was already facing after whistleblower Francis Hergen, a former Facebook product manager, expressed the company's awareness of harm caused by its products and decision. <laughs> I mean, yesterday I was so frustrated, but it talks to the power Mark Zuckerberg holds globally. I mean, it feels like he is <laughs> social media god because everyone was frustrated. They couldn't get on social media, especially the fact that we had that Twitter. We have this Twitter ban in Nigeria, Tundu. It's awful, isn't yeah. it? How was this monopoly allowed to happen? Mm. Yeah. If there was any doubt about that man's power, that yesterday it. dispelled it. Yeah. And it. the fact that so many people, businesses, it shocks me that businesses are completely reliant on his platforms. It shocks me that businesses don't have their own website, for example. Everything is on Instagram. That's extremely risky, and I think they all should learn a lesson from that. I'm sure Mark Zuckerberg himself has learned a lesson with his platform as well. And also, apparently, the fact that people were working from home hampered them scrambling around to sort out a solution to this problem. It's been a terrible week for Mark Zuckerberg with that whistleblower that you referred to as well and his $6 billion poorer. But before we weep for him, he's not going to have to cut corners. He's a sensibillionaire who'll be just fine. Exactly. But I do think that all of this is going to further... Uh, 
you know, loud on those voices that are against the kind of monopoly that he enjoys. And I see a breakup coming soon. Yes. A WhatsApp, Instagram, and Facebook in the same person's hands? Yeah. No. But a lot of people are saying, uh, Dr. Abati, how is it that it was right after the whistleblower came out with that 60-minute interview that this whole shutdown happened? It happened six hours, over six hours, Dr. Abati. No, in fact, five hours, yeah. to be specific. Well, they said six hours. Some well, reports are yeah, saying six it, hours, it, yes. It, yeah, they resolved it right. within that time frame. This is not the first time it will happen. It happened in July uh, 2020. Yes. It also happened, uh, you know, um, earlier this year. But previously, when they had that uh, breakdown, uh, they were able to resolve it within one hour. One hour, yes. This time around, they started struggling with it within uh, five hours. Now, what all of, all of this uh, indicates is what Walter Benjamin calls the technical reproducibility of the age, which was predicted before we moved you know, from one uh, technical revolution to the other. And what we're witnessing is, is the discontents we they are dealing with in India, in China, in other parts of the world. Now, the technological backend can fail. It has failed before with regard to Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram, because they are all connected at the uh, backend. But the cultural question that we have to deal with is how dependent we have now become on uh, the technical reproducibility, the electronic reproducibility of the age. I once wrote a piece in which I asked the question, how did we live when there was Before. no mobile phone? Night when post. there was no... It was night post when there was and no, letters. Yeah, those days when... Yes! <laughs> we used to queue up pen, at pen uh, phone we stations had a lot of pen pals. just to make yeah. uh, phone calls. Correct. And, you know, we depended on uh, letter writing, mm -hmm. the epistolary uh, yeah. mode of living. But technology has transformed our lives. We've become all dependent. Yesterday, Nigerians were having panic attacks. Mm -hmm. People were calling me and disturbing me, you know, from thinking, uh, oh, check your Instagram. Is it working? Check your Facebook. Check your <laughs> WhatsApp. I think the only people who have gained in this regard is that, yes, um, you know, Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, they've been able to explain that this is not as a result of any attack. Uh, it was just uh, some glitch at the uh, back end, and they've restored it. And you can see the calm, yeah. you know, uh, you know <laughs> eventually when they were able to resolve it. Also, there was a dimension to it yesterday. People were blaming the Nigerian government. <laughs> they were calling up and down that they've started again. Oh, <laughs> you no. know, Buhari gave an uh, October 1 speech. It. Uh, he was Buhari. talking about conditions. I didn't hear that. So, yeah, are, they that. Applying, <laughs> are they applying the same conditions to Twitter, Instagram, and uh, WhatsApp? Do they want to kill us? You know, and I kept saying, no, we don't have the evidence in that. No. Regard. So, for the Nigerian authorities, there will, this will be some kind of relief mm -hmm. to know that, you, look, this is some problematic thing at the technological edge, and it's not about the Nigerian government uh, trying to go overboard, yeah. you know, and commit uh, political suicide. Yes. Because to amount to political suicide, yeah. to uh, this uh, Z generation, you guys mm. call them, right? Mm. Uh, yeah. You know, to go ahead and uh, rob them of right. something that keeps them alive. So I think all is well, that right. has ended well, yeah. mm. but you shouldn't have to throw our phone. On the other hand, Dr. The older Martin, generation will be disturbed. What we've heard, what we've heard is that Mark Zuckerberg had to shut it down to try to clean up a few things. I mean, because of the whistleblower. What do you think? Uh, no, so, so for me, I, I don't think that's the case. That's because he lost $7 billion. Dollars. Yeah, yeah, I, I, don't, I, don't, yeah, I don't do I, conspiracy I, I, theories. I don't think that's the case. I think, that's the conspiracy theory. Yeah. And I'm sorry to say this, I don't trust Facebook's statement. Uh -huh. I think something actually happened. Yeah. I think it was hacked. Some people have indicated that. I think maybe they were not successful when attacks were made at Facebook because of the restoration time. Yeah. If you are having, you know, interlayer settlements, your restoration time should be quick. I mean, this is back-end technology. This is algorithm. But the restoration time was long, and there were frantic calls being made yes. as regards that. What that shows is the fact that we should be careful. There's so much power resonant in one man's hand. Uh, I'll tell you for free. Mark Zuckerberg is the most powerful man in the world. You know why? The man that has That's data That's what I has realized power. only yesterday. And he's got he's, power. He has been he's for got a while. data of over close to 4 billion people in the world. Yes. Everything he's about you. He's got everything about you. 4 yes. billion people in his hands. Yes. So he's the biggest bohemoth you can ever think of. And at some point, that decomposition will come in. 
But I'm not afraid. You know why I'm not afraid? Yeah, Dr. Abbas, you talked about, you know, uh, evolution of time, evolution of technology. But I think it was also Joseph Schumpeter, the economist, that talked about the Schumpeterian gale, creative destruction. Mm. We see this now, but something too will have to evolve. You remember how telephony was the big thing? When Graham Bell discovered telephony and mm. it was the biggest Alexander form of contact, Graham Alexander Graham Bell. And afterwards, then something disrupted telephone. You remember when uh, uh, Lungi Bird discovered the television in 25? Mm -hmm. Prior to that time, it was newspaper. In fact, when Lungi Bird in 1925 wanted to go showcase his new discovery called the television, he went in front of the Times office in London, a newspaper, to write about him, and he said he was mad. But television was disrupted. Then you have internet. Now, internet will be disrupted, and there will be better iterations on Facebook. So technology will disrupt itself. But it is something that calls all of us to question that we should look at it critically. These tech companies, they are big tech. They own our lives. They do. But I don't think Facebook is entirely being honest. And he's a business. He will not Everyone be honest with you, even if he was honest. No, but remember the movie, Social, yeah. Network, Social Network. Social Network. And that Kanye West song, No One yeah. Man Should Have All This Power. power. He's exactly. always been. That's but, an but, old but, movie. But, but and it's been so it, powerful. It is a seminal moment for the world yesterday. Absolutely. Well, but in any case, tech, technology going forward will always dominate our lives. Yes, yes absolutely. Yes, so we deal with that reality. Yes, whatever well comes said, guys. Going forward. We'll take another story. Human rights lawyer Femi Falana has criticized the federal government's decision to support herders who are planning on challenging the anti grazing law in court. He says their decision is unconstitutional and described it as political suicide. Palana made the comment while responding to Dr. Uma Gwandu, the special assistant to the Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, Abubakar Malami, after Dr. Uma reportedly claimed that the federal government supports moves by herders to sue southern governors over the anti-open grazing bills they recently signed into law in their respective states. Palana says the move is a gross violation of Section 17 of the Constitution, which provides that the Nigerian people are entitled to equal rights and opportunities before the law, and Section 42 thereof, which has prohibited the federal government from conferring advantage on any group of citizens. Everything they say about the federal government of Nigeria, the rule of law, they are not abiding by the rule of law, completely unacceptable if this actual report from Uma Gwandu is true. If it is, I agree that it could be political suicide yeah. in any other country but Nigeria. But here, I really do wonder. I mean, you were talking earlier, weren't you, about the people. Where do the people stand in all of this? Yeah. The people are sitting, they're like, <laughs> they're not even sitting. They're lying flat. They've been dropped on their behinds. Nobody cares in this political yeah. elite that we're talking about, about the people. And this is what is obvious to me. If, if your vote actually mattered, would anybody dare to think about doing something like this. I mean, it's just so disgusting, right in our face, that we're complete non-factors in the entire political cycle. You are saying the people of Nigeria are going to decide. No, they're not going to decide. It's the political parties that will decide. And then the rest of us, what's that apocryphal um, quote that's attributed to Joseph Stalin? That it's not you who cast the vote that matters, it's the yeah, person it's who's the person counting. Who counts the vote. This is the thing, we don't factor in anything. This is actually really offensive to me. Mm -hmm. And as offended as I am, I can do nothing. nothing. I remember the, in, in Indonesia in the 90s, the KKN protests against Suharto in their um, Indonesian language is spelled K, corruption, collusion, nepotism. We have that troika here in Nigeria and nothing has been happening. It was that on day one. There was an election. We returned those same people. So what's going to happen that's any different in 2023? And there was a text message I read from earlier, Mr. Finney's segment, about how when we're thinking of who we're going to elect in 2023, we shouldn't just look at the man. We should look at the structure that, he, that supports him, the structure under which he's operating. You referred to the civil service. We also have to look at the constituency that backs these people, because this kind of situation we're not being served as a people, as Nigerians. Yes. These people are facing squarely one constituency, and the rest of us can hang. Very well yes. said, Jim. Rufai, your analysis. I mean, but that's, but that's the point. I mean, this just goes to show the kind of country we have built. This is the only country I know in the world that people make a deliberate attempt to be backward. Why must cattle graze indiscriminately? Why must we graze openly? Anywhere. And you see... Let's, let me put forward the logic. Does open grazing increase meat output? No. 
Go and check on the charts. First 10 beef producers in the world. I'm not sure you find Nigerians on that list. No. Does open grazing increase milk output? No. Go and check. First milk, 10 milk producers in the world. You're not going to find Nigeria there. So the question is, what does it do? What's the logical sense of open grazing? And a lot of people are saying, ranch. The governors are saying, we'll even take funds, set up a place for you to ranch, where the cattle can get veterinary care, which is very important, where they can get good nutrition, hay, pasture. I mean, Nigeria meat is very tough to eat because of the excruciating conditions. You know, if we had rights for cattle, our cattle should complain. These people, these herders, violate the human rights of the cattle by taking them indiscriminately from place to place. That's not the way cattle should be bred. You shouldn't breed cattle that way. You keep them in a confined place where they can have access to nutrition, good food and everything, so that their meat will be good. And we are saying, let's move away from this past. People and some people say, we'll insist. So it is obvious that there is something more than cattle in all of this matter. I think cattle is just the face of this matter. There is obviously something. What could it be, though, Dr. Abati? Okay, let's deal with the substantive issues. This is a statement made by Dr. Uma Gwandu, Uma Gwandu yes. representing uh, the Attorney General of the Federation at an event. And he was talking about it's a very sensitive issue mm -hmm. in Nigeria. And he was saying, more or less, that, look, uh, the federal government of Nigeria will support those who are challenging the anti-open uh, grazing, who are challenging open grazing. Uh, in Nigeria, and who have gone ahead to, uh, you know, uh, put up bills in that direction. In other words, the office of the Attorney General, more or less, is uh, taking sides yes. in a matter that is political yes. and that is sensitive. I think that's the tragic point yes. about this particular matter. And I think that that's what uh, Femi Falano, SAN, is drawing attention to, that the, the office of the Attorney General and Minister of Justice cannot be used to reprobate and approbate or play politics, Absolutely. partisan politics. That's the main point, because that office is very important. The Attorney General of the Federation is the chief law officer of the Federation. He is the chief law advisor to the government of Nigeria. And that is why that is the only position that is expressly recognized in the Nigerian Constitution. And then you use that position that is supposed to promote the rule of law to play partisan politics. I wouldn't be surprised if before the end of the day, Dr. Gwando comes forward to say it was quoted out, out of context. context. That's why I said Or that, that journalists are the ones That's causing exactly problems. Right. They had better you know, So say that. that may well happen. Never know. But if indeed he said that, yes. uh, that's an abuse of the privilege of the office of the Attorney General of the Federation. The Attorney General's office must be seen to commit itself to the law and I guess also again. That was why uh, Femi Falano SAM was throwing the law at that office. He quoted, he quoted uh, section 17. 17 and 42. Section 17 is not justiciable. That's under, uh, you know, uh, chapter 2 of the Constitution. Although Femi Falano uh, was the same person who led the argument about how sections, uh, the chapter 2 of the uh, Constitution has become justiciable with regard to a particular ruling. But he then quoted section 42, you know, which says simply that you cannot discriminate against anybody in this arrangement. So the, the, the issue really is about the office of the attorney general taking sides. getting involved, oh, in taking sides, playing partisan right. politics. And I think that should not happen. Very well said. We'll take our final story. Following reactions trailing new exercises launched by the Nigerian army to tackle security challenges in the country, the chief of army staff, Lieutenant General Farouk Yahaya, who flagged off the launch on Monday, said the exercises will entail joint operations between the military and other sister security agencies and was designed to check all forms of criminality. The exercises include Operations Golden Dawn for the Southeast, Operation Stillwater for the coastal areas, and Operation Enduring Peace for some states in the North Central and Federal Capital Territory. I mean, tensions have increased actually in the southeast uh, with this uh, whole new security outfit uh, that has just been launched. But I mean, the names really are cracking me up. 
<laughs> do you remember Operation Python Dance? Yes. Operation Crocodile, Crocodile Smile. Smile. I just always wonder how the army comes up with these names. We're back I do too, on the actually. Note. I but do I think too. it's a great, great uh, thing that the uh, Nigerian army, uh, you know, has initiated really following all of these attacks that have been going on in our country. I completely agree with you. They're not yeah. sitting there doing nothing. Yes. They're trying to take the situation in hand. Apart from the complete lack of national cohesion that we're facing yes. now, insecurity is our biggest challenge. Yes. Nobody is sleeping with both eyes closed anywhere in this country. So I'm really glad that the army is responding to that. And yes. hopefully there will be no abuses, because I do worry about that as well. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Refi quickly your analysis. On this. For me, this is just an indication that the army is terribly, terribly stretched. How did we get to a point in the country? Internal activities like this is supposed to be for the police force. But almost everywhere is on fire in Nigeria. Yes. That's why you have the army being deployed everywhere internally. Absolutely. How did we get to this point in Nigeria? That everywhere is on fire, from the east to the west to the north, everywhere. You know how many thousands of troops that will be deployed across the country? You know the thousands of troops that will be deployed? Wow. Well, Dr. well under the uh, Nigerian constitution, the military can be called out on the invitation of civil authorities if there is uh, an issue in any part of the country. But yesterday we spoke with AVM Bali, mm -hmm. that's his name, and he was making the point that, look, we don't have enough personnel. We need to recruit more people. That in itself is an issue. So when the military, then you deploy them to do police work, do you have enough at the back end that can do military work? That's a big issue. The second issue is that we have all these operations. The latest, I mean, they are very good at coming up with this. I uh, love it. I like that. Like <laughs> <it. laughs> operation uh, Still Water. Still operation Water. Uh, Enduring uh, Peace. Enduring so Peace. Uh, door. Uh, yeah. Operation Golden Door. Fanciful <laughs> Yes. What have we achieved? with these freshers. In uh, the East, you had Operation Python, you have op Operation Igweke 1 uh, and 2, you know. The military didn't make any difference. All those exercises for that deepened the conflict, That's the tension, point. the problem in the southeastern part of Nigeria. So it's not enough to have these ceremonies and announce all these fanciful phrases. I, I, phrases. I think it's important for the Nigerian military to measure input in terms of outcome and how that makes a difference. We have that disconnect in that regard because, you know, the military, yes, civil aid to, uh, you know, an aid to civil authority, but what is the result? We need a rethink. We need a reconsideration. We need introspection, even within the military. Thank you very much. Thank you, you amazing team. Thanks, oh, <laughs> Should I tell them you bought me a... No, nothing. That's uh, all I have for you on what's trending today. <laughs> I'll see you tomorrow.